A third of a century later, my annual cost of living at a level which permitted me to travel to give lectures and to design and physically produce improved mass production prototypes of living re artifacts reached my 1917 assumed total live on its interest capital equity of $50,000 being completely spent each year. I sold my life insurance policies to the life insurance companies for their then accrued cash value of $22,000. This bought me the time to develop the geodesic domes. Today, as yet living in the same manner while doing the work essential to following through on my life commitment to solve socioeconomic problems exclusively by inventions and development of artifacts instead of by politics, my annual cost of operation has reached $300,000 for servicing my commitment to problem solving only by artifacts with no savings accruing whatsoever. Because I am not a business or a corporation, my gross intake is rated as personal income and I am therefore in the 50% tax bracket, which precludes my saving any of that income, should I wish to, which I fortunately do not though I am convinced that I am getting more for humanity with the dollars I spend than is any form of tax-supported government expenditure. Each of the three Dymaxi and three wheel front drive rear steered cars built by me in the depths of the 1930s depressions cost $28,000, i.e. $84,000 in all. Today they would cost 20 times as much for the same vehicles built of the same materials. Boastfully ethical big business and banking have reduced my necessitous and desirable acquiring capability by 95%. That is, they have priced and otherwise manipulated the money game in such a way that $95 out of every $100 I have earned has been taken away. Life insurance companies bet that humanity is going to live longer than it expects. Those who buy life insurance are betting that they are going to live shorter than the insurance company thinks they are going to live. The life insurance companies invented the term expectancy of probably to be realized longevity of specific classes of humans existing under various environmental conditions in contradistinction to the now workingly assumed unvarying maximum limit of 113 years for all people. The overall history of humanity's attained longevity is one in respect to which the average individual's attained life span has progressively increased from a probable average expectancy of 19 years of age for the people of 5000 BC Egypt, at 16 years Alexander the Great was the world's leading general, to 70 years in AD 1980, USA. Though manifesting many setbacks, the overall evolutionarily inexorable increase in longevity of those living within the technologically advancing environment is a product of humanity always gaining more experience and learning ever more from its errors of conceptioning and acting on how to cope more effectively and intelligently with the progression of natural exigencies. Humans gain despite enormous setbacks by industrial environment polluting. The insurance companies collect all possible vital statistics governing the probabilities of individual human survival under all the known controlling conditions. The insurance companies have large staffs of statisticians known as actuaries who, aided today by computers, are able ever more effectively to render the insurance corporation's stockholders' bets to be approximately sure things. In investing the insured's premiums today, they find IBM, DuPont, and other such stocks to be sure things, and tax-secured U.S. government, state, county, and municipal bonds the most risky of investments, for reasons we will later examine. During the first three quarters of the 20th century, average life expectancy in the most favorable environment countries has almost doubled. When I was born in 1895, life expectancy for a male born in New England was 42 years of age. On July 12, 1933, I passed my expectancy day. On July 12, 1979, I completed my second lifetime, or double expectancy. I am now in the third year of my third expectancy lifetime, and am very healthy with a new stainless steel hip I have just acquired. My two completed lifetimes and my third of a third lifetime have found the great majority of savvy, well-to-do individuals I have met convinced that there exists 
an inherent inadequacy of life support on planet Earth, and therefore that their own successful survival as well as that of those whom they cherish depends upon their cleverly learning more and more about how to be legally selfish and thereby to accomplish personal economic advantage by anticipatorily depriving others in directly undetectable ways. These ways are legally and socially accepted practices of deceiving and cheating the public, example by altering the scoring system of the official game rules of the accrued monetary equities of other humans through zoning laws, etc. In 10 to the 10th ways. Price manipulation is most often defended as being governed by supply and demand variables, i.e. by what the traffic will bear, and not by time energy costing, which science finds to be exclusively operative throughout all the constant energy transformings and interchangings of the universe. This legal deprivation of other humans to one's own personal advantage is most simply accomplished through increasing rents or prices of a cup of coffee or a second-rate cigar, both of which have escalated during my lifetime from five cents to fifty cents. The powerful social precedent for price advancing has been initiated by non-perishable mine and oil well owners and those other prime industrial producers, the physical cost of whose products measured in ergs of energy per hour and pounds of coal or petroleum per pound of manufactured goods has steadily decreased. The acceleration and technological enhancement of the living environment apparently accounts for marked life expectancy increases in post-World War I, Canada, USA, Sweden, Australia, United Kingdom, New Zealand, Netherlands, Japan, in these countries. In 1968, the value of life insurance policies in force exceeded their respective gross national incomes. In the USA, in 1970, there were 355 million life insurance policy holders. This being more policies than citizens meant that many citizens hold several policies. In 1970, the assets of 1790 U.S. life insurance companies totaled $208 billion. Throughout the history of the United States of North America until 1952, the federal, state, and municipal bonds guaranteed by the tax-collecting capabilities of those authorities fortified by their ability to seize the property of tax evaders were generally rated the most secure of securities to protect the USA population. Until 1952, the states and federal government required that all life insurance companies, all savings banks, and all trust funds invest only in notes and bonds of the ever suitably increasable tax-supported federal, state, municipal, and multi-state authorities whose bonds were officially qualified by federally supervised authorities as being legal for trust funds. Included in the trust funds category were all the bank or lawyer administered wills and trust funds of all kinds, all employment or executive retirement funds of corporations, labor unions, or cooperatives, all savings banks and life insurance companies. In the post-1933 pullout from the absolute economic crash years of 1929 to 1933, the U.S. Congress approximately unanimously enacted a number of measures essential for coping with the economic errors clearly manifest in the post-mortem studies of the Great Crash. Essential to the correction of those errors was the establishment of absolutely interconstant price, wage, rent, and interest rate controls. Profits were not only permitted, but welcomed. They had, however, to be inventively attained by producing more, better goods, more satisfactory services, etc., for the same or lesser amounts of energy, time, and materials invested. Thorough review of those 1930-42 to 42 economic climb-out years events and their utter undoing in 1952 is clearly related in the chapter Legally Piggly in my book Critical Path. In 1952, the 20-year moribund GOP regained control of the political initiative and immediately eliminated all price, rent, interest, and wage controls. It also passed laws allowing insurance companies, savings banks, retirement funds, and all trust funds in general to invest in common stocks, preferred stocks, and corporate bonds. This also brought about the formation of a myriad of investment trust funds. It did not, however, allow the U.S. government or any of the states, counties, or municipalities 
to invest the enormous Social Security Automatically Tax Collected Individual Workers Funds or any other of its future committed economic responsibility funds to be invested in any other than its own USA government, state, county, or municipality dollar savings accounts whose purchasing equity was being ever depreciated by inflation. With wholesale industrial prices freed to escalate, though protested against by the U.S. Eisenhower through Carter presidents, retail prices, wages, and corporate share prices, as traded on the stock markets, swiftly escalated in response. So-called inflation was inevitable. What the Colossus media call inflation is, of course, deflation of humanity's buying power. Inflation does not increase the true values, nor produce more or better goods. All talk of Federal Reserve rediscount rate increases acting as an inflation retardant is in fact only rationalization camouflage for escalating bank usury rates, though a Federal Reserve interest rate increase may produce a momentary deflection in the rate of inflation curve. It never does any more than that. There is no evidence whatsoever that Federal Reserve rediscount rate increases successfully arrest inflation. This being so, the continuance of such interest rate increases ostensibly to combat inflation as actuated by the private enterprise control and deceivingly misnamed Federal Reserve Bank system must, in historical retrospect, be identified as a fraudulent means for increasing the profits of the banking system. When Nixon cut loose the U.S. dollar from its U.S. government, 1933 fixed $32 an ounce relationship to gold. The U.S. citizens' dollar equity declined precipitously. The last third of a century of overall stock market price advances in direct correspondence to the role of inflation and business pricings in general has produced ever-widening but false gaps between people's government fund equity values and the portfolio of world-around stock market values of the securities of the private enterprise system.